What would you do to get ahead in life? What sacrifices would you make? What lengths would you take to sacrifice others to get what you desire? Ah, such is the dilemma faced by the protagonists in tonight's two stories, both from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up, so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all to you. Now, my dear friends, we're about to embark on another week, so you know where to head to for great stories? That's right, my dear friends, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I won't give you my real name, for I'm afraid it could reveal my whereabouts or possible position if someone else sees this that was involved. For the sake of anonymity, let's just call me Joe. So, here we are again, another deployment out in the vast, endless ocean. You see nothing but crashing waves and the deepest blue in every direction. You don't know loneliness until you are stranded a million nautical miles from anywhere. No one hears your screams or cries for help when you fall 150 feet from the flight deck of a monstrous 900-foot warship. The ship is so massive that even after years of sailing on this vessel, I still get lost. Thousands of marines and sailors board it, as well as cargo, food, ammunition and other supplies. Sailing through the Suez Canal, coming from a base on the east coast of the United States. We're making our voyage. Experiencing engine failures along the way. Engineers are working overtime. Cutting power, replacing broken parts. Even having some things flown in for finishing repairs. I have a promotion exam coming up soon, so I suppose I should study. I hate reading and I'm not good at memorizing material I'm not interested in. However, I could cheat. I found a way to get the answers before the exam. I know many of the supervisors who are in charge of administering these tests we have to take in order for advancement in rank. One in particular, Officer Jones. She's a new member of our staff, and is still green. <laughs> Wet behind the ears, you could say. I befriend her, and quickly gain her trust, and even gain access into her stateroom. This was strictly prohibited. Enlisted sailors and officers under no circumstances could be in any type of relationship. If caught and prosecuted in captain's mass, essentially your career is over. Dishonorable discharge. You may as well be a convicted felon. That's how you'll be treated. I begin to see Officer Jones regularly. We form a bond. I tell her how amazing she is, how lucky I am to have met her. He even said I loved her. Yes, my plans are in motion. It's now days away from taking this exam, and a major promotion for me. Huge rank advance, and in pay as well. I enter her stateroom, where she lives and sleeps. I swipe her copy of the test answer sheet as she falls asleep. I quickly make my escape. Run to the admin office in the back of the ship. I know the code to get in. It's three in the morning, and this space is empty now. I make many copies, as I intend to sell my newly acquired answer sheet. And these will be worth tens of thousands of dollars to other sailors. Run back to her room and place them in the drawer from whence they came. Coast is clear. Well, I thought. <laughs> Smiling to myself and feeling smarter than everyone else. So, I begin approaching potential customers and assuring them these are the real answers to the upcoming advancement exam. Some days pass, and I'm rolling in the cash. New customers daily, as the test is coming soon. Word gets around that someone is selling test answers. I need more copies. I begin to get sloppy and become greedy with my new found shady business deal. The money is just too good to resist. Now I have what I wanted. I'm in my bed trying to memorize the order of the answers. A, C, C, 
B T C A D A F. Oh, this goes on like that for two hundred houses. Damn it! How can I memorize them all? Oh, to hell with it. I'll do it later. I lay awake in my rack, contemplating how to solve my newfound problem, until something horrible happens. I make my way down to our space where other sailors live and sleep, basically. Seaman Smith approaches me. Joe, we need to talk, he says. Oh yeah, what's up? I ask with a puzzled look. I know what you did, and I'll report you to the commanding officer, unless you give me the answer sheet for free. Shocked and caught off guard by his blatant attempt to bribe me, I utter, yeah, Of course. I begin scouring my lockbox, frantically searching for another copy. I'm all out. Looks like I'll have to make one last trip to the stateroom to get another copy. Heading down the P ways of the ship, I hear a familiar voice. Hey, Joe. A sweet voice calls out to me. I walk over to her. She cautiously invites me to her room once more. I know what you've been doing, and I won't say a word to anyone, but you cannot ever do it again. I'm not willing to risk my career over this. The only reason I'm protecting you is that I really care about you. Now, please leave before I change my mind. Great. Just great, I think to myself. My cash cow is dead. I'm out of copies. My girlfriend just dumped me. And now I have this asshole trying to ruin me if I don't give him the answers. I can't even find my own copy. What options am I left with? Risk giving him the wrong answers and him report me after he finds out? Or the other? Hatch an evil plan to cover my ass. Oh, how could I be so careless? How did I mess things up so bad? Who told him about my business? What do I do now? These were all questions I thought as I stood there with a blank expression on my face. It's the big day. I take the test, and I'm confident I'm answering them correctly. Oh, wait. Let me just get a few wrong. Wouldn't want to look too suspicious and get them all correct. Days come and go, and the results are in. I scored in the 97th percentile of everyone tested. <laughs> oh yeah, I thought. Time to get promoted. Yeah, I thought to myself, all the while still pondering how to solve this issue with Smith. Him and I are due on watch soon as aft lookouts. We reach the rear of the ship as the clock strikes midnight. There we stand, in the cold empty abyss on the flight deck. That is soon to have a double meaning for one of us. A raspy voice comes over the radio as we lurk around the flight deck, searching for debris, whales and other ships. Seaman Smith, please report back to Combat Information Center. Damn it. I check the watch bill. We're only on watch together a few more times, and the deployment is ending soon. We're both rovers and walk the decks of the ship. I've got to come up with a way to well, take care of Seaman Smith. How do I go about this? Could I gain access to the armory? Maybe acquire a gun? No. Too messy. Too loud. I'd be caught for sure. I've got to solve this problem before I run out of time. I need to dispose of him. We throw all of our trash overboard. Maybe I can force him in the trash compactor one night. Well, days come and go as I'm plotting my next move. Time's running out. This is now one week left on deployment. Tonight's the night, I say to myself. We're on watch together for the last time. This certainly is my only opportunity as he's been demanding all the money I've made or he'll report me. I have approximately $10,000 left after sending a good portion of it home to my brother. I've already asserted I'll give him the money after we return home. No good, he says. 
I want the money before we dock, or I'm reporting you to the CO. The pressure of his blackmail is bearing down on me like the hot African sun when it's 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Believe me, I was there. It's horrible. Maybe not as horrible as the predicament I find myself in now, but still pretty bad. I get to the flight deck early, waiting on Smith as I'm building up my courage to do what I've got to do. He's five minutes late now. Where is he? Has he figured out my plan? But how could he? I never mentioned it to anyone. My palms start sweating as I see my chief starting to walk towards me. I know he sees the worried look on my face. He approaches me, and I can feel the pounding of my heart even in my head as he begins to speak. OS2. You're going to be training a new S on watch tonight. A wave of relief washes over me. But then I realize my plan has gone to shit. And a new sickening feeling has found its place in my gut. God, what am I going to do now? I can't get my mind off Smith and my next plan. As I'm walking the ship doing a half-assed job at training the new OS. I know he can tell something is up as I'm mentally not there. Watch comes and goes as normal. Another dark night in CIC. Training for tonight is completed. Off to bed, unsure of my fate. I'm now in a lightless P-way heading towards my rack. Mentally drained, and now afraid for my freedom and sanity. Or at least what's left of it. Laying in my rack, drifting in and out of sleep. Half awake, I notice something. The ship is rocking harder than normal. Oh, I've been on enough deployments to know what rough seas are like. This isn't just normal waves. Seeing uniforms and boots scattered throughout our living space, confused and disoriented, I find my uniform and get dressed. Barely able to keep my footing, smashing into the bulkheads with every step. Finally arriving to the flight deck once more, I see forty-foot waves crashing violently against the hull of the ship. Over the ship's intercom, we're now being informed we've entered a hurricane, and everyone is being urged to stay off topside of the ship, as it's too dangerous to be outside with the high seas. A thought begins raining over me. A smirk begins to form across my face, as a sudden realization hits me like a ten-ton hammer. I know what has to be done. Waves crashing violently. The ship is rocking hard against the unforgiving and endless ocean. Frantically I'm scouring the ship, knowing I am nearing the end. I have to find him. Running up the steep stairs looking in every space as my body is smacking up against the ship's walls. The crew is in the mess hall, eating chow. I begin to head aft of the ship from my position, hoping I can spot him. He isn't waiting in line, nor is he eating. Remembering now, he was training on the bridge, top side of the ship. Fighting through the crowds of marines everywhere, I struggle to find my way in this chaos. Feeling eyes watching me, everybody is looking at me like a madman. Maybe I have gone mad. Eventually, filing the stairwell to the bridge, I burst through the door, staring at ten officers and enlisted personnel. I find Seaman Smith and tell him he's needed on the west wing as lookout forward of the ship immediately. Feeling the storm begin to die down, I know this will be my last chance to strike. No one will find him in the bottomless abyss. The deep blue sea is mad today, and it's going to grow in population. Well, if only by one. I manage to keep myself behind him, walking in sync with Smith, while also keeping an eye out for anyone who could spoil my plan. As we pass by several spaces, I think to myself, could this be the place, or that, but no, not quite. Well, that is until I spot the perfect place. The safety railing is low here. 
even though he's a big man, standing at six foot three and two twenty pounds. Well, I'll have to push hard, as there's a security net designed to catch fallen assailants, whether by accident or suicide. The fall is over a hundred and fifty feet from this part of the flight deck. Carrying a pipe wrench I'd stolen from one of the engineers, I strike him over the back of his skull. His body is limp, and quickly falls, and is leaning over the rails. I squat down and grab him by the legs and hoist him over the edge, pushing with all my strength to ensure he avoids the safety net. I look down, seeing his body falling like a rag doll until it splashes into the depths. The water, pulling him under as we're moving full speed at twenty-two knots. I open the nearest hatch, moving through the ship with haste and fear. Adrenaline pumping, and so is my heartbeat, fast. I arrive on the watch, wiping sweat from my brow. Eight hours pass as I try to hold myself together, realizing the severity of what I had just done. After twelve hours of no one seeing or hearing from Smith, a search party is formed, but to no avail. He isn't found and a man overboard commences. We've moved several hundred miles since my last encounter with him. In that storm, no way in hell we would find him. Three days pass, and they complete their official report. He's ruled as a suicide, never to be found. We're soon arriving back in port, our deployment finally over. I've just committed the perfect crime. As we make our way back home, I pack my things in sea bags, feeling relieved that my business deals have been kept quiet, and I now have all this money. Hmm, a new car, perhaps. And that's when I notice a note on my pillow. It reads, I know what you did during that storm. Have you guys ever been hunting? I ask this because up until this point in my life, I have never tracked or killed anything. I'd introduce myself, but I can't remember my name. I just kind of woke up in a shed in the middle of the woods. You know the outhouse from Shrek, well, put a sun on the door instead of that stupid crescent moon and bam, that's me. Well was me as of a day ago. When I came to, it was just me in a small box. Hell, I stayed in there for a few hours just to make sure I didn't miss anything. It was like a safe space in the middle of my own personal hell. When I opened the door, what I saw was beyond my imagination. It was just forest, never-ending greenery. I began to scout around, just hoping to find something, anything at all that would help me find my way, but it was a waste of my time. I went in all four directions for over half a mile, and there was nothing. Figured out east and west, hoped that my guesses were right on north and south. Night was about to fall, and this feeling of being watched, and this anxiety, this fear that I was going to die, was setting into my soul. This didn't make for a peaceful night. Every creak, every gust of wind that blew leaves off their branches made me wake and peek out of the cracks of the small outhouse. I figured that all of my senses were tuning into my fight or flight response. Weird, but this morning I awoke and next to me was this pad of paper and a backpack. My fears all but realized. A man knocked on the door. Dressed in a suit, this man was tall, around 6'2", and muscular. He had this elegance around him, this vibe that was mysterious and wrongly devious. I had a growing suspicion that he may be the reason why I am in Timbuktu. When he spoke, 
I was mesmerized by his smooth and deep voice. I want to strike a deal with you. The man smirked. He ran his hand through his scraggly hair before he took a deep breath. My name is Igor. What? Uh, uh, Igor, what do I need to do to get out of here? I'll take your wager, but I want something in return, I replied. There was no way I was doing anything for free. Oh, see, I like your spunk. The deal is if you find Anne Hunt, the other candidate, I'll let you leave and give you a parting gift. He smiled slyly. You want me to kill someone I've never met? That's it. And if you can't, then... He was cut off by my voice interjecting. I I'm in. I have to live my life, you know. I smiled. Igor snapped his fingers, and the pack I'd woken up next to was filled with essentials, as Igor called them. A Glock 17, a couple of knives, ammo, and food and water. Igor's parting words were a short, Good luck. Then he vanished. I was alone again. Now I know that I'm hunting, and being supervised while I'm doing so. Igor said that there was another candidate, which means that, in all likeness, they are armed too. It's common for humans to wander in circles in the woods, so I figured I'd try to get to some high ground, mainly a strategic point of view so that I could see more of the surrounding area. I hiked for a couple of hours, it seemed like, and familiarized myself with the firearm Igor had given me. And now... We are in the present. I've caught you guys up in the story. Judging by the sun's position directly overhead, I'm assuming it's noon or around there. Now, as I said earlier, I have no experience in hunting. This is just my intuition now. I figured high ground was important. Not to mention that I'd noted the location of the shack I woke up in been carving up trees with the knife that Igor had put in my bag to make sure I don't get lost. I'm assuming I'll have a couple of days before someone, well, finds anything of mine. So, I plan on marking up trees with different symbols to lead them someplace else. I'm going to work for a couple of hours. I'll update you guys when I have some downtime. I spent this afternoon marking trees that lead to different places. Some of them lead to the stream of running water I found, then the others I've made run in circles just to confuse anyone that might be looking for me. The circles intersect, so it'll be tough for anyone to follow them accurately. I've done almost everything I can think of to protect myself. I'm tracking back right now to go to the shack. I've made like, four trails today and made sure I knew how to follow them. I'm sure someone with more experience would know that a couple of the trails were fake, but I hope it'll buy me some time at least. I'm not staying in the shack tonight. I've been gathering materials all day while making stops at bigger trees to find little platforms to sit on. Of course, I'm not staying up in any of them. That would be suicide. It's dark now. I'm about 200 yards away from any trail I made. I figured that sleeping away from the things I made is the safest possibility for a good sleep. I'm going to try to sleep, but from here on out, I feel like it's going to be me hunting someone down. And it might not be in my favor. I groggily awoke to very loud steps crunching on dead leaves. And the realization that all of my efforts may have been in vain. Though, I'd be an idiot to not take this as an opportunity to finish my task, I suppose. Assigned to me by Igor. I unzipped the bag I was using as a pillow, and gripped the handle of the pistol and slowly inched it out. I waited in silence, and listened to what sounded like an exhausted, burly man. I'd already gotten four hours of sleep, 
I got up as quietly as I could and repositioned myself away from the man. I laid on my belly and watched him from a distance, all while keeping my gun ready. I decided to wait until daybreak before I made any moves. When the man awoke, he quickly gathered his stuff. I noticed he undid a perimeter that he'd set up, cans and wire to make a noise if anything were to get close. He was a lot shorter than me, and I felt a difference in skill, or at least a difference in intuitiveness and a will to live, I guess. The man began to walk off. I stayed a while and began to follow him when he was about 50 meters away. For a big guy, I was surprised he hardly left any footprints. Now, I followed this man for hours, and he was only circling the outside of all my trails. The outhouse remained in the center, but the man noted all of the platforms and the different marks on all of my trees. And he chuckled a few times. I wonder, though, what had Igor offered him? After hours of monotony, the man bolted directly towards the center. We had gone full circle. I tried to follow him in step, but he changed his rhythmic pacing every few minutes. He reached the cabin and opened fire into it blindly, the whole clip. The man reached his hand to push open the door, and that's when I fired. I hid him in the center of his back. He fell into the outhouse, struggling to stay upright. I rushed him. I fired again, this time aiming at his leg to make sure he couldn't move. The man groaned and grabbed his knee, rolling on the ground. Sorry, guy, but you just try to waste me, I said, raising my gun once more, pointing it at his head. I had to... That man said he'd kill my family, the man sobbed. I didn't want to converse with the man any longer. I couldn't, unless I intended on letting him live, that is. So I put my finger on the trigger when Igor popped up behind me. I lied. You don't have to kill the man, he sighed, gazing at me, putting a hand on my shoulder. A deal's a deal. I sighed as I pulled the trigger, my bullet piercing the man's head, the spatter of blood, unforgettable and scary. When I turned to face him, he had a smile across his face. Mm, you're right, a deal is a deal. I'll hold up my end and I'll give you a little something extra. I want out of this forest. I want to be somewhere where I can get a burger. I joked. Oh, I'm glad I chose you. I do like your spunk. Now, give me your hand. I obliged, and then we were in a cafe. I recognized the place. A quaint and small place in my hometown. A joint called The Friendly Toast. Oh, I was so unbelievably filled with bliss. So... That, um, little something you spoke about. What is it? I inquired. His grin from earlier came back. Oh, a mark of power on your forearm. You're going to mark me? Why, why, why would you do that to anyone? I guess there should be a motive. And Igor grabbed me and put his hand on my arm. A searing pain surging through it. Oh, I guess I don't get an answer for that one, I said through gritted teeth. And it was burned into my skin. An L shape with X's on the end, and two lines meeting a circle. As soon as I looked up from the mark on my arm, Igor was gone. Everything was so vague, so... I'd like to ask you guys what the hell you think is going on. Who the hell is Igor? And most of all, what is this mark on my arm? Well, 
I hope you enjoyed those two stories, um, both from the vault. Uh, I really, I really like them. Um, kind of similar in theme, but tell me what you thought. What would you have done in those situations? Would you have done what you needed to to get ahead, or was that a little bit too much? I kind of hope it is a little bit too much. Too much for me, certainly, but, well, there you go, it's only a story. So, back again on Wednesday. Um, until then, you make sure you have sweet dreams, okay? Only a story, just remember that. Okay, until then, bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it, if you like, on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now... Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>